I'd like to start really by um, turning to Dia straight away. Why make a film about the human face of extremists? Because it's, it's the layer of the conversation that I was really missing. Um, in our public discourse, we're always talking about, <coughs> is it religion? What aspects of religion is it? Is it foreign policy? Is it history? Is it social? Is it economic factors? And of course, all of those layers are a part of the picture. Um, but being an artist, being a woman, what was the most inspiring and interesting to me was to try to see if I could get to the human factor, the human layer of this entire conversation. And I found that to be lacking in the public discourse. Are you trying to ask the audience to empathize with extremist positions? There are certain people who will go to this extent. And so I needed to understand that. And the reason for that is not really to excuse or sympathize, but it's to try to understand. And the reason understanding is so important is if we are to be effective in resisting this movement, we have to first understand its human appeal. What is it that this movement offers to our young people that somehow the rest of us are not offering to them? If you had the Prime Minister David Cameron sat in front of you and you had to say to him, the problem is, mm -hmm. in extremism, the problem is this, what would this be? I think what I would probably try to say to him is two things. One is that we keep talking about young people a lot. We don't really talk to them and with them and we don't listen to them. And I think that's incredibly um, foolish. I think it's not productive. We can't sit here and talk about a group of people and not actually engage with, with them. Because the fact of the matter is they are our young people. Doesn't matter how misguided they are, doesn't mean, you know, matter how twisted they are, they're our kids. Second thing I would say is that we have to engage uh, with women. Many of us have had exactly the same experiences that many of the men in this film described. Many of us have been resisting this movement for the last three to four decades. And when we were dying, when we were suffering, nobody cared. But now that their guns are pointed towards the West, everybody cares. And now that everybody cares, what I would like to see happen is for our governments to make the correct alliances for once. And I think those alliances are genuinely with our young people and with women as a start. I would want to say, should we have any sympathy towards you? You cause the problem? You're part of the problem? The straight answer would be no. You should not have sympathies towards people like myself and others who are like me or how I used to be. Because we create an immediate problem and we make the problem worse by continuing in our efforts to bring justice without knowing either what justice is all about, how to do it, and what the realities are. But we are human beings. Uh, I think my story tells, uh, dispels the fiction that uh, perhaps we are different types of human beings. We're just like anyone else. And the second important <coughs> um, lesson is that we can all change. But I have to do penance. So I come from a religious perspective. I've understood jihad, uh, Islam, <coughs> in a manner with deeper thought, deeper study, wider uh, kind of exposure to other opinions, that all of that can be carried out in a positive manner. And there are certain concepts in Islam which are ill understood and ill taught which continue to exacerbate the problems. So uh, I will work with prevent, MI5, police, CIA, I don't care. Because for me, I want to do something good in preventing crimes. But Elias, do you <laughs> think the policies that successive governments have put in place, say, over the last 10 years, are they working? No, I, I think they're fundamentally failing. Prevent now, for example, I've been up and down the country talking to practitioners. Youth workers are a last bastion of what I call a safe space, where young people can go to someone who they trust, who they see as credible, they can unload, they can, they can talk about anything they can, they can, di they can disclose but, uh, their experiences, and they genuinely have that, that relationship built up now. Now, I'm telling youth workers up and down the country, you are no longer youth workers, you are security officers. Schools are no longer schools. They are places which monitor okay, extremist behavior. Now young people will learn that they cannot disclose what's going on in their lives to anyone out there. 
the spaces have become closed and you know more and more closed, which pushes young people into dark, ungoverned spaces. Before, prevent became a statute, had a statutory basis Absolutely. and became mandatory in places like schools. Was enough being done? What I would say is that we're going through a learning curve, and that there was a point in the learning curve where we were actually. I think positively engaging with young people. Then the, government, the new government came out with a definition which shifted away from extremism being defined in terms of actual incitement towards violence. Now, I think everyone can subscribe to that. Everyone subscribes to the idea that individuals who are inciting violence or committing actual acts of violence have to be stopped. We now move towards this kind of very grey area and actually I am defined by your government as an extremist because I am very critical of prevent. I work in the non-governmental space. There are thousands of people in this country, up and down the country, who are talking to really angry and frustrated people. And you saw a, a, an example of that. Very damaged and traumatized young people out there who have extremely chaotic lives and have experienced terrible levels of violence and abuse. Every day we have people actually averting them from a self-destructive path and channeling them into something positive. Those individuals are actually being seen as suspects now because they're not being incorporated into the security apparatus. This is an emotional and social development issue and it's a public health issue. It's not a criminal justice and securitization issue. I work with traumatized children every day. They seek normality and they can't see any normality now in the public space here in the UK. Surprise, surprise, ISIS offers more normality to traumatised children than we're able to offer them. Do you feel British Muslims feel like they belong? I think some young Muslims feel they do belong, but I think a huge number of Muslims, especially post 9-11, I think feel like they don't belong. We live in diverse, intercultural, multicultural societies. That's just a fact, it's a reality. How can we live together in a way that is where more of us feel like we're a part of our future? To me, everything boils down to what is it that makes us human? We also have to acknowledge the beauty that comes with people from all over the, the you know, different corners of the world, but also the challenges and the ugliness that we all bring with us as well. So I, 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 what I would like to see is more openness, more honesty, that the fact that this thing, this movement is expanding in the way that it is so successfully is partly, not only, but partly because we can't quite figure out how to live together. It's not a matter of do Muslims feel like they belong. Do we treat them as if they are our children? Questions, who's gonna ask the first question? Alias, you raised a really important issue, and that is uh, sexual dysfunction within yeah. the Muslim community. Uh -huh. How do you begin to broach that subject? It's a fundamental aspect of human behaviour that we have sex and we have sexual urges. And if you, if you come from a community where you don't even talk about it, it's a taboo subject, it's a stigma subject. You're suppressing something very, very powerful. We need to open the spaces up <laughs> in the Muslim community. Some people might have heard my documentary, Muslim Sex Doctor, <laughs> recently, and it caused lots of outrage. You know, can our imam really be a sex doctor? <laughs> Okay, and I was thinking, well, you know, would you say that to your own, any other doctor, yeah? So, it is still really problematic. Sex ed relationship education is bad in schools, full stop. You know, we have a massive problem around sexual bullying, sexualized violence. It's a global phenomenon. One billion women in the world experience sexual violence. So we're really failing young people across the board in terms of SRE. We need good quality sex and relationship education, focusing really on the R part, which is relationships. Jasmine's an example of that. I started working with her originally because she looked for support around the fact that she's a survivor of sexual abuse, and there was no one supporting her. All I can say is there's still a, bit to, a way to go, but there are, you know, interesting kind of, you could say, chinks in the wall, you know, in terms of kind of opening up that space. To what extent do you think it's purely a Muslim issue and not and other communities don't have this problem whereby they don't feel a sense of not part of being British. I don't find this to be an exclusively Muslim thing. This is why I was also saying that, you know, be, being a woman, you know, coming from a minority myself in, in, in the upbringing that I've had, feeling sort of the, the compression of discrimination from my parents' community because I'm a woman and from the wider white society because I'm not white. Our society when it comes to its prime enemy at this point, post 9-11, it's become Muslims. So the way that we speak about Muslims has sort of shifted. I always find issues with people who have extremist views and then turn to the opposite extremist views, like, like the three of you tonight. 
Um, so it's, I find it quite hard to trust everything that, you was, that you're saying. But oh, yeah. most people that I grew up with who have, if they didn't have these issues of necessarily feeling of belonging, of British or not British, they got on with it, they were happy, and they didn't turn to violence. I just find that you find it quite an excuse for whether they belonged or not in order to turn to violence. And I need to know if there's something more than that. In the work that you do, Munir, do you, do you uh, ever reference back to other communities who in the United Kingdom may have had similar experiences? Uh, historically speaking, we shouldn't look too further than the issues we had with the Irish community in the 70s and 80s. Uh, particularly when working with young people, I try to focus on what identity means, as opposed to telling young people what their identity is. Uh, I think similar experiences are found within the African Caribbean community that I grew up in in the 1970s and 80s. Uh, particularly, though, in reference to the current debate, this is about perhaps how a community becomes a suspect mm. community. I think we do have to separate the term ideology from the term religiosity. Hmm. Uh, and a lot of young people that I work with wouldn't be able to tell you the difference between the two. So therefore there's an element of resilience that you need to build first hmm. through awareness hmm. and then there's an element of critical thinking that comes after the resilience has been built. Therefore you would understand uh, religiousness, hopefully, in a different way than you would understand a political ideology hmm. which Islamism or jihadi narrative clearly is. You know, when you come across families who are planning and plotting to go off, selling all their furniture, everything, giving up their jobs on holiday to Turkey and then stopped and brought back or what have you. You have to ask their grandfathers, mothers, young children involved. It's not about trauma in life. They have a certain attraction to go to a place where they feel the Islamic State has been established. Abdawla or Khilafah. The Sharia has been applied, the Islamic law. And there is also a strain of uh, understanding within the Muslim body politic which advocates that you cannot really properly integrate amongst the non-believers. So unless we are brave enough and honest enough to tackle these issues in a mature way, we are always going to have those problems compounded by everything that others have said. I used to work a lot in um, prisons. A lot of the prisoners I worked with, a lot of the inmates, um, turned Muslim while they were actually in prison. The prisoners who had converted to Islam did not imagine beyond the Quran. They were not able to engage with their previous life. They were only able to actually talk about what was in the Quran. There's a narrative that is within Islam, within radical Islam, that appeals. I think it stimulates in a similar way to actually the way that um, right-wing extremists are stimulated, the way that conspiracy theorists are stimulated. Look, being alienated and lost is almost a definition of adolescence. And, and, you know, characteristically, any extreme set of beliefs is attractive around 18 to 25. If you look at any cult recruitment, you know, whatever it is, Scientology or, you know, extreme cults, Trotsky, whatever it is, that's the age that it gets them. But what bothered me, I think, um, Abu Munjir, just hear about what you just said, is, the, uh, is the, that core belief that you can't live a fully... Islamic life without living in, as it were, an Islamic state. And when you say that you have to be brave enough to tackle that, what does tackling that mean? What I detect is there's a reluctance to robustly address issues such as establishing the Islamic state, the Khilafah, or living amongst the non-believers, the Kuffar. I met with one of the people who, um, who was responsible for trying to blow up an EDL, English Defence League, um, uh, meeting. All, all he said was he wanted to kill those people because they insult the Prophet Muhammad, peace be on him. So there is that teaching, we, and, he, and he mentioned the book, and I said I can give you the re reference from my memory, the quotation in it even. We can always press into service quotation excerpts from medieval books and all sorts of Islamic sources, which can satisfy the desire of this, that, or the other individual who has a grievance or a, or a score to settle. I feel the, imam in the imams and teachers, intellectuals, academics have a duty to look at all these concepts. I mean, does insulting the prophet merit the death penalty? If it does, who has authority? Muslims should be encouraged, young people especially, to channel their energies, hurts, angers, ideas, revenges, into constructive, positive work. It's, it's about disconnect. The vast majority of imams in the UK 
do not have the skills to even engage well, Generation yeah. Y. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, they don't know their lived reality. They can't speak their language. And you know, on a global level as well, even though 99% of scholars globally have condemned ISIS, their communication is still crap. Yeah, you know, true. they, you know, ISIS. Everyone knows they're wrong. I talk to young people every day. They know they're wrong. But guess what? They just communicate much better. It's not about the theology. It's about connect, having a real conversation. The connection with our is people. spoiled because of the theology, and it's not mature enough. It's not advanced enough or adapted enough. I know that for a fact. Mm -hmm. When I went and I inspired you or yeah. criminalized you or corrupted you, mm -hmm. it was based on religion and faith. It wasn't about... I, I, I Actually, it was more than... You know, everyone asked me, was I, I didn't buy into anything that you were saying. That's not the issue. <laughs> the issue, the issue the, no, Do you know, but I was there for a different reason. Okay, but the, okay. See, the, see, the issue is, people like myself are totally yeah. British, yeah. didn't feel disconnected, yeah. and we went for martyrdom. To me, it was a counterculture. It was, and I say ISIS is as well today. It's two fingers up at everyone. The first two fingers were up at my family. Mm. Next was society at large, you could say, who has othered me repeatedly. Yeah? So there is that element to me of just finding something which is the biggest way to be as outrageous as possible. And that's the same why the reason why kids are in gangs. And the mm. same reason why people end up in cults. When does an ex-extremist become acceptable? Right, you have that time away where you can critically appraise and you actually have a moral compass yourself which says, this does not make sense. I believe that goes on in the thought process of all people who are in extreme. Because it does, it fundamentally conflicts with your human programming, which is to preserve life. So at what point do you trust an extremist? When there's a complete renunciation of that past and that there is a restorative element to it. If you had one ask of uh, the British Muslim communities, and I'm, you know, you can't kind of lump them all together, but if you could, and you had one ask, Munir, what would it be? Uh, seek first to understand before being understood. Ilyas was talking about two fingers. I've only ever had two fingers. <laughs> so I could choose to stick it to anybody I wanted to, but I had enough human consciousness to leave the prospect of dying for someone else's conviction. And if the British Muslim community is going to listen to me talking, then they would see that if a misfit like me can come to terms with me, maybe we can come to terms with what it means to be British and Muslim, inshallah. What I would like to see happen is for there not to be a British Muslim community, for there to be British citizens who have different interests, different loves, different desires and dreams and hopes, but they all belong to us. And for all of us to have access to the same rights, one of the biggest mistakes that most of our governments over the last couple of decades have made is treating the Muslim community as if it is one block of people who are all the same. They are not. What we have done is we've made the devastating mistake of empowering these self-appointed old guys, Muslim leaders, I am the whatever recent guy who speaks for everybody. None of them speak for us. None of them speak for me. We can only speak for ourselves and we can only be treated as individuals. As individuals. That is it. Thank you.